Okay, so this is your first lecture for this course, and as you can tell by the title of this lecture series, we will be discussing the science of human movement. Most of you at this point of your education generally understand that voluntary human movement can only be through the contraction of muscles, which is the fundamental function of muscle as an organ. Now, we first have to understand the basics here. What type of muscle is involved in locomotion or simply movement, like when we exercise or need to walk from one spot to another or to pick up a pen or text on a phone? You should all know by now it's not cardiac muscle, it's not smooth muscle, it's skeletal muscle. So all the muscles we know and love like our quadriceps, hamstrings, biceps, pectorals, these are all skeletal muscles that contract to shorten or lengthen while producing force, muscular force, so that we can produce joint actions like elbow flexion and extension when you're doing like dumbbell curls, for example. These joint actions all coordinate to produce movement of the body. So the question is, how does this happen? In physiology, we call the explanation of the hows for whatever bodily function as the mechanism of action. So if I'm asking about the mechanism of action for muscle contraction and thereby movement, I am simply asking how it happens. Mechanisms of action are for the most part sequential step-by-step -step processes. So step-by-step -step from a starting point to the end point. Now we already know the end point. It is muscle contractions that produce joint actions which result in movement like when we exercise. The more complex question is how do we get there? Well, one major way to explain the mechanism is through the communication between two physiological systems, the nervous system and the skeletal muscle. Now, like I indicated earlier, skeletal muscle is unique from the other types of muscles in that the contractions are primarily voluntary, meaning in order for one to contract a skeletal muscle, there needs to be a conscious effort. Now, although we are often unaware of it, we have to think about moving before we move. Now, there are certain incidences when a skeletal muscle contracts pseudo involuntarily, and that is referred to as a reflex, but we will get to more of that later. So if it is a case that skeletal muscle contractions is a conscious effort, where do we do our thinking? In the brain, right? So we know that the signal for muscle contraction and thereby movement all starts in the central nervous system or CNS for short, more specifically the brain, even more specifically the motor cortex of the brain, which is right smack down in the middle. Now from there, signals that are generated from the brain transmit through the spinal cord, through the nerve cells or neurons of the nerve tissue and eventually reach the muscles you want to contract, resulting in, you guessed it, a contraction. Now this is a very, very, very general breakdown of the mechanisms, and of course we will discuss in a lot more intricate detail, but the point is that we should have the fundamental understanding that voluntary movement or locomotion, like when we exercise, lift weights, or get up from your chair, involves a mechanism or process that conjoins the nervous system and the skeletal muscle. So much of the characteristics of a muscle contraction and therefore movement, such as how much force is produced or how fast the contractions need to be, is majorly controlled by the nervous system. So many tend to focus too much on the skeletal muscle itself when it comes to contraction, where that is only one part of the mechanism's underlying movement. This is why when we talk about human movement, we describe it as a neuromuscular process, not just a muscular process. It's again, a process that starts in the nervous system and ends at the muscle. Okay, so for all my lectures, I like to not only provide a little intro like I just did to set the tone, but also provide an overview of the general topics that will be discussed in the lecture series. Now, first I found over the many years of teaching this course that it is always a great idea to do a little anatomy and microanatomy review. I am more than understanding of the fact that we are humans and we forget things, especially if we don't think about it, apply it, or regurgitate the stuff we learned in the past. So don't feel overwhelmed if you have forgotten a lot of details regarding the neuromuscular system, especially when it comes to the structure of muscle cells and its key organelles. So to start off this lecture series, we will do a rundown of the basic structure of muscle cells, which obviously make up muscle tissue. 
Now keep in mind when I say muscle cell or muscle fiber, I am referring to the same thing. When cells have a linear fiber-like structure, we often call the cell a fiber. Another example would be a nerve cell or neuron that makes up nerve tissue is often referred to as a nerve fiber. So anyways, the reason why we will go over this microanatomy is because I know students generally are visual learners. And so if we are discussing the mechanisms of muscle contraction, it will be helpful to be able to visualize where all the intricate steps are happening. So you will find that my lecture slides are full of visuals to help you do that. We will then review the sliding filament theory, which some of you may or may not have heard of. And this is the fundamental explanation of how a muscle and its muscle fibers shorten or lengthen while producing force. Like for example, when you curl a dumbbell, you shorten your bicep. And when you bring it back down, you lengthen the bicep all while producing force. So we're going to discuss what happens inside your muscle cells to allow the muscle tissue to shorten or lengthen. Then we will go through the neuromuscular mechanism underlying muscle contractions and movement, which will be the largest chunk of this lecture series. Now, as you can see here, this term EC coupling describes the overall mechanism. Now you might remember from your basic human physiology course that EC coupling stands for excitation contraction coupling. When we think about excitation or cells that are excitable, we think of changes in the electrical properties. And if we think about a certain type of organ or cell that causes excitation of other cells, we may think of the nervous system. We generally know that nerves carry electrical signals to excite other cells like muscle cells. So EC coupling is a process that couples or conjoins the excitation to the contraction, meaning contraction of the muscle is a result of excitation, which is caused by electrical signals from the nervous system. So EC coupling describes the neural and muscular process of contraction and movement. Now we will go through the entire EC coupling process in a step-by-step -step fashion with a lot of visuals. So you can eventually describe what is actually happening the next time you do a bicep curl or kick your leg, or even just type on your laptop it will really help you gain an appreciation for things we often take for granted like muscle contractions and just movement in general. Now, once we finish discussing EC coupling and how muscle contractions work, we will talk about muscle contraction characteristics, particularly on how we produce different levels of force when there are different force demands for a given movement. For example, how am I able to curl a 10 pound dumbbell then in the next set, a 20 pound dumbbell, then a 30 pound dumbbell. Or when we walk on a flat plane and hit an incline, what happens in our neuromuscular system for us to be able to produce more muscular force so we can go up the incline? For that given movement of a bicep curl or elbow flexion, how am I able to produce increasing levels of muscular force going from 10 to 20 to 30 pounds? What is the process or mechanism underlying this? Now the process of producing different levels of force, which we will discuss in much more detail towards the end of this lecture series, is what we call force gradation. So we will discuss the mechanism underlying force gradation production of different grades or levels of muscular force. Again, being able to explain how we are able to produce different levels of force when the force demands go up or down. Now, by the end of this part of the lecture, you should be able to explain the next time you lift weights, how you are able to squat 100 pounds for one set, then 150 pounds the next set. Now, just to clarify, here the word acute just means immediate. So how does the neuromuscular system immediately respond to situations in which you need to produce different levels of force for a given movement? Now, finally, up to this point in this lecture series, we are only talking about communication from the nervous system to the muscle to produce a contraction. Now, this direction of communication is referred to as efferent, E-F-F, E-R-E-N-T. So signals going from the central nervous system, the CNS, to the muscle, such as during a contraction, are called efferent signals. So the question is, 
Do signals go the other way? Meaning, does the muscle communicate with the central nervous system? Do muscles send signals to the CNS? Yes, it does. And these signals that go the other way are called afferent, A-F-F-E-R-E-N-T. So afferent signals, or in other words, sensory signals. When we sense things, these are signals from outside the nervous system coming into the central nervous system. For example, when we touch something, that sensation of touch is a signal from the skin that is transmitted through sensory neurons, so sensory nerve cells, towards the central nervous system where those signals can be translated to the sensation of touch. Now, just like skin, the muscle is one of the largest sensory organs within the body. It is constantly sending sensory signals to the CNS. Most of these signals are for the purpose of allowing us to know how our body is positioned. Without these sensory signals from the muscle to the CNS, these afferent signals, we wouldn't be able to sense how our body is positioned. Like for example, we can't sense that our arms are extended or flex or if we're sitting or standing. So we will spend time talking about skeletal muscle as a sensory organ and what type of afferent signals and information is being sent to the CNS and how those signals are generated. Now this topic has a lot of implications for physical and occupational therapy which a lot of you guys will get into because oftentimes movement impediments or even things like tightness, like muscle tightness, is a sensory issue, not really an issue in the muscle tissue itself. So by the end of this portion of the lecture series, you will be able to understand how we sense body positioning, the science behind muscle tightness and stretching, and also how sensory signals can be used to enhance muscle contractions especially in high power movements like jumping or sprinting. Now, prior to getting into the scientific information, I find it important to really highlight the significance of this topic as it relates to you and your future. Now, oftentimes students get into a course and never realize the significance of the things they are learning and how it applies to their lives, especially their future career pursuits. So why is the topic on neuromuscular control of human movements significant to you? Well, first, we are all, at least for the majority, kinesiology majors. You will eventually have a degree which hopefully signifies that you have an advanced knowledge of kinesiology, which is the science of human movement. So if someone asked you after you graduate the question of how do humans move, you should be able to answer that question that is fundamental to the field that you are majoring in. If you can't answer that question, well, wouldn't it be sad to say that you have a degree in the study of human movement if you don't really actually know how humans move? So let that sink in for a bit. Now, second, many of you will pursue professional fields such as physical and occupational therapy, uh, fitness, strength and conditioning, etc., that are predicated on optimizing and or restoring movement, physical function, and performance. So if you don't know how muscles contract and thus how we move, then how can you develop programs and treatments to optimize and or restore movement? For example, from a medical standpoint, there are many conditions in which muscle function is impaired because somewhere along the process that leads to muscle contraction, there is a defect. For instance, there are diseases in which the communication between the nervous system and the muscle is blocked or inhibited, such as in multiple sclerosis, which we'll discuss later on. Now, if you don't know the entire mechanism of muscle contraction from the central nervous system to the skeletal muscle, how can you then identify the step that is defected? And if you don't know which step of the muscle contraction mechanism is defected, how can you create targeted treatments for that patient? Now, I often run scientific seminars for rehabilitation specialists like PTs and OTs. And before the seminar, I do a little anonymous quiz. And one of the quiz items asks to describe the mechanism underlying muscle contractions. And you would not believe how many of these professionals whose profession is mostly predicated on restoring muscle function and therefore movement do not know how muscles actually contract, which is something so fundamental to their practice. This is what separates a good practitioner to a bad one. It is the basic scientific literacy of the human body, in this case, human movement, kinesiology. 
So don't be the PT and OT or fitness professional who doesn't know the basic science. I guarantee when you have an advanced understanding of how the body works, you will set yourself apart from the others. I promise you. So you may not understand the complete value of what you are learning here right now, but trust me when I say you eventually will. One of the best things I hear from former students who go on to PT, OT, PA, or other related graduate programs is that they are years ahead of their peers in graduate school when it comes to exercise physiology, especially neuromuscular control of human movement, which is a huge chunk of PT and OT school. So I encourage you to understand that your time and attention now is an investment that will pay off in your future education and in your future careers. Trust me on that one. All right, like I said in the very beginning, I want to first begin by reviewing skeletal muscle anatomy starting from the macro level to the micro level. Now what I mean by that is we must understand the levels of organ physiology. The most macro, largest level would be the organ tissue level. This is what we can see with the naked eye. An organ is a tissue or group of tissues that exists for a particular function in the human body, which in the case of muscle would be to contract and produce forces. I'm referring to skeletal muscle. Oh, by the way, when I just say muscle from here on out, I am referring to skeletal muscle. So the skeletal muscle organ is not just made up of muscle tissue, but also connective tissue. Uh, the network of connective tissue in skeletal muscle is commonly referred to as the myofascia. And there are specialized layers of the myofascia called the extracellular matrix or ECM, which is generally compartmentalized three ways. The epimysium, often referred to as the deep fascia, is the most outer layer of connective tissue that surrounds the entire muscle. The perimysium is the second layer of the extracellular matrix that surrounds bundles of muscle fibers called the fasciculi. More on that later. And the third and finest layer of connected tissue or ECM is the endomysium, which surrounds each individual muscle fiber. So if you pull one of these fibers out, it's surrounding each of these muscle fibers. Now, the ECM and myofascia in general are connective tissue, which generally we know serves to connect things together or keep things together, which it does in this case. It keeps the muscle together in a particular form, and it also connects the muscle to the bone through a very tough connective tissue called the tendon. The myofascia, including the ECM, all integrate into the tendon, which again attaches to the bone. This way, when the muscle contracts and produces force, the force can act on the bone through the myofascia to the tendon and thereby produce a joint movement like a knee extension or flexion, like when you kick a ball. So with that said, another major function of the connective tissue in the muscle organ is to transmit forces across the muscle to the bone. If there was no connective tissue like the myofascia and the tendon, the muscle can contract, but joint actions would not be produced because there is nothing connecting the muscle to the bone and therefore no force transmission from the muscle to the bone. So yes, the myofascia is very much involved in muscle contractions and movement, but the focus of this lecture will be more so on the involvement of the skeletal muscle itself, the skeletal muscle tissue. So the major component of the muscle organ is skeletal muscle tissue. And as you can see right here, the muscle tissue is cut cross-sectionally. So you can see the inside of the muscle belly. So let's dissect this down all the way to the microscopic level, down to the most micro level. So what makes up the muscle tissue? muscle cells, or in other words, muscle fibers. Again, muscle cell and fiber are one and the same thing. We know tissues are made up of cells, and so skeletal muscle tissue is made up of skeletal muscle cells or muscle fibers. Another term that is used to describe muscle cells or muscle fibers is myofiber. Myo referring to muscle and fiber again referring to the fiber-like cell. Now you can see here that there are bundles of muscle fibers. 
We refer to these as fasciculi. A fasciculus is a bundle, a single bundle of muscle fibers packaged together by the surrounding paramecium. So if we pull out one of these fasciculi, we have a single fasciculus right here. This is a bundle of muscle fibers. This outer layer right here is the paramecium extracellular matrix slash myofascial tissue. So let's pull out one of these fasciculi and you will see within the fasciculus we have muscle fibers all bundled together. So now we are at the cellular level. We're getting towards the most micro level. We went from the organ tissue level now to the cellular level. Okay, we're looking at an individual muscle fiber. Now this is part of the semi-micro level because you can't see it clearly with the naked eye. Although you sort of can in some instances, you can isolate a muscle fiber and it sort of looks like a strand of hair, but you can't see it in much detail. So now let's dissect this even more to the most micro level, which is the molecular level. Tissues are made up of cells and cells are made up of molecules. These are microscopic things. You can't see it with the naked eye. So if we pull out one of these myofibers, we can open it up and see what's inside of it. And this is where we're going to focus because the processes that happen inside the muscle fiber lead to the contraction of the muscle fiber and therefore the entire muscle tissue. So when the muscle contracts, it all starts at the molecular micro level inside each of these individual muscle fibers you see right here. So we need to look into the muscle fiber and see how it looks and how the different molecules involved in muscle contraction are arranged within the muscle fiber. That way you can visualize everything when we discuss the actual process of muscle contractions. So let's go ahead and pull out one of these muscle fibers and zoom in so we can see the innards of the muscle fiber to, again, be able to visualize where everything is. So here we have a single fiber that we pulled out and we got the cross-sectional view right here and we got the longitudinal view right here. The outer membrane, which is called the sarcolemma, please remember that, is cut open so we can see all the different organelles and structures within the muscle fiber. So first of all, just to be clear, organelles are tiny cellular structures that perform specific functions within the cell. Just like how the whole body has organs with specific functions to keep the body alive and running, organelles are miniature organs, if you will, within each cell to keep the cells alive and running. Now, for the sake of keeping this relevant to the topic at hand, I'm only going to cover here the intracellular components that are pertinent to muscle contraction. For now, we are just going over the basic location and function of each organelle and structure, just so you can all visualize where everything is when we talk about muscle contraction. Now we will get into much more detail on what they specifically do during the discussion on the contraction process later on. So the first organelle is the sarcoplasmic reticulum or the SR for short. As you can see in this figure, it is colored in blue. Just FYI, it is not actually blue. Now you can see that the SR has a web-like network feature that pretty much runs the entire length of the fiber and it also wraps around these small fiber-like structures which we will discuss later. You can see that it wraps around it. Now one of the key physical characteristics of the SR is that it is a sac, so it's hollow inside and represents something like a network of soft tubing. So as for its general function, one, it helps provide structural support for the muscle fiber since it does in fact run the entire length of the muscle fiber and surrounds the key structures within the muscle fiber. Now secondly, it houses and secretes intracellular calcium ions. So calcium ions that are inside the cell is housed inside the sarcoplasmic reticulum, the SR. So more on this later when we discuss the mechanisms of muscle contractions and, uh, and what role the SR plays in that process. So the next organelle is the transverse tubule or T-tubules. As you can see, it is essentially a tube that runs from the sarcolemma, so the outer membrane, into the muscle fiber and it's surrounded by the SR it is essentially sandwiched 
between the segments of the SR, as you can see right here. This creates the triad structure, which I'll show you in a couple slides. Now think of the T tubula as a sewer hole. The street is the sarcolemma, the membrane of the muscle fiber, and the sewer hole is the T tubule. The sewer hole is an opening in the street and provides an access way into the ground underneath the street. In the same manner, the T tubule provides an opening in the sarcolemma and an access way into the fiber from the sarcolemma. As indicated here in the third bullet, it is a transport system for electrical impulses to propagate or travel from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. Again, more details on this later, just need you to be able to visualize the structure of a muscle fiber for now and all the key organelles inside it. Now let's focus our attention to these structures right here that look like cylinders that run along the length of the muscle fiber. You can see here that they have very unique physical characteristics. Now these structures, these cylinder structures are called myofibrils, M-Y-O-F-I-B-R-I-L-S. And they are made up of specialized proteins that are involved in muscle contractions. Now these proteins are collectively and generally called myofibrillar proteins, proteins of the myofibrils. And as a side note, which we will cover in this class, what explains muscle growth when you resistance train is an increase in the number of myofibril proteins. So this increases the size of the cell and therefore the muscle tissue and also contributes to strength. So this tells us that these myofibrils and the myofibrillar proteins that make up the myofibrils have something to do with contraction and force production. So let's go ahead and zoom in even more and look at one of these myofibrils in isolation. So these myofibrils, like I said before, run the entire length of the muscle fiber and they're all bundled together within the sarcolemma. And these myofibrils are segmented into what we call sarcomeres. This is described as the basic unit of skeletal muscle because inside these sarcomeres are those specialized myofibrillar proteins that are arranged in a very specific manner. Now the arrangement of those myofibrillar proteins is what gives off the patterns you see on the myofibrils and therefore the muscle fiber. So from here to here is one sarcomere that contains myofibrillar proteins in a very special arrangement. So the sarcomere runs from one Z disc to the next Z disc. And these Z discs are made up of specialized structural myofibrillar proteins that hold the myofibrillar proteins involved in contraction in its particular arrangement. So if you zoom in on the sarcomere, as you see right here, you will see the main components. You see the Z discs or Z lines here again, made up of structural myofibrillar proteins. And it holds this thin linear structure here highlighted in blue in this particular position. Now this thin structure is called the thin myofilament or just simply the thin filament and is comprised of specialized myofibrillar proteins. Now this thin filament is often referred to as the actin filament because one of the major myofibrillar proteins of the thin filament is actin, which we'll discuss in a bit. I just don't like calling it the actin filament because the thin filament contains proteins in addition to actin. Now within the sarcomere between the ends of the thin filament, as you see right here, is the M line, which is also made up of several structural myofibrillar proteins. And these structural proteins in the M line keep another myofilament in its position. This myofilament is called the thick filament, AKA the myosin filament. Now this filament also contains specialized proteins that are involved in contraction, mainly the protein myosin. That's why it's called the myosin filament. Now, as I said earlier, the sarcomere is specially arranged in this particular fashion shown here. And the arrangement of these myofilaments, as you see right here within the sarcomeres, is very, very important when it comes to muscle contraction. As you can probably tell from the arrangement of the thin filament to the thick filament, 
that perhaps there is a physical interaction between the thick and thin filament to allow for the muscle fiber and therefore muscle to contract and produce force. Now, when this arrangement is disrupted within sarcomeres, like when you damage your muscle after heavy exercise or during a muscle strain or tear, or when one has a muscle disease or myopathy that results in damage of these structures, there's an impairment of contraction and therefore muscular force production. And we've all experienced this after heavy resistance exercise that we're not used to or accustomed to, we not only get sore, but our muscle fibers have become damaged and we have temporary reduction in strength. We feel a little bit weaker. Why? Well, one reason besides soreness is that our muscle fibers have undergone damage due to the high levels of tension from lifting heavy weight. And with that, the arrangement of these proteins within these sarcomeres become disarranged and thus the myofilaments are not in its proper position. The thin and thick filament are not in its proper position because the sarcomere structure has gone messed up because of damage. So this suggests that the proper arrangement of the myofibrillar proteins, more specifically these myofilaments, the thick and thin myofilaments within these sarcomeres is very important for optimum force production during contraction. It is very important for strength. So as a summary to this slide, the contractile machinery, so the machine that is involved in producing a muscle contraction, is all packaged into these tiny sarcomeres. So it's all at the micro level. So it's molecules that contribute to when you say kick your leg or you curl a dumbbell. It all starts here within each of these sarcomeres. So this is the contractile machinery. Now, before we dissect the sarcomere even further, I want to show you this slide that displays a real image of a muscle fiber using a light microscope. This is from one of my past studies. Now, this type of analysis in science is called histology, which is the study of cells or tissues using some type of imaging technology like a microscope. Now, this is a longitudinal view of the muscle fiber that is sliced long ways. So you're looking at the, the long side of the muscle fiber. Now, here we see rows of myofibrils. These are those little cylinder structures within the muscle fiber that are sectioned in individual sarcomeres as highlighted here inside this red box. Now, these dark lines right here are the Z discs or Z lines. And you can see coming off of these Z discs are light bands, which are rows of the thin filament. Now here where it becomes darker is where the thin and thick filament overlap. And this line right in the middle is the M line, which again are made up of structural proteins that hold the thick filament in its position. Now when you see this during histology that the Z disc or Z line is squiggly, this is a sign of muscle damage and is referred to as Z line streaming, a possible potential bonus question on the exam. So when you see squiggly Z lines on a histological image, that's called Z line streaming and is a marker of muscle fiber damage. So if we did an experiment where we took muscle biopsies before and after heavy resistance exercise, we will see more Z-line streaming after the workout than before. Remember, the Z-line holds the thin filament in its proper position inside the sarcomere. And when the muscle fiber becomes damaged, the Z-lines can become damaged. The thin filament is now out of position and the myofilaments are not in its proper arrangement. Now this contributes to the temporary reduction in strength that is associated with muscle damage. So when we see muscle fibers in those who say overtrain, who constantly pound their muscles day in and day out, and they notice that they're getting weaker instead of stronger, we see a whole lot of Z-line streaming in their muscle samples, which again, partly explains why overtraining is accompanied by strength loss. So remember, strength or force production is highly reliant on the interaction between the thin and thick filament as we see in this previous slide, the physical interaction between these two filaments. So if they're not in its proper spatial arrangement because these Z discs have been damaged because of heavy exercise, for example, 
then they're not in its proper arrangement and they cannot physically interact with one another efficiently. Again, that physical interaction, which again, we'll talk about in much more detail later, is important for muscular contractions and force production. Now over here, you can see these three structures. It's kind of faint, but you can see a big circle here, a little one here, and a big circle here. Now this is the triad structure that I was talking about earlier. This right here and this right here is the sarcoplasmic reticulum, the sac-like feature, and the T-tubules run in between it right here. Remember that T-tubule runs from the membrane of the cell, the sarcolemma to inside a cell, and runs in between, sandwiched between the sarcoplasmic reticulum segments. So going back to the sarcomere, let's go ahead and zoom in even more and take a look at the individual myofilaments even closer. So you can see how they can physically interact with one another during a contraction. Now here you'll see the two myofilaments, which again are packaged in a special overlapping arrangement in the sarcomere. First, let's look at the thin filament, often referred to as again, the actin filament. Why? because the major protein that makes up the thin filament is the actin protein. And you can see that depicted here in the figure as a yellow globular protein. Now actin is referred to as a contractile protein because it is a direct player in muscle contractions. More on this later. Now actin has the resemblance of two pearls twisted together as you can see right here, creating a thin linear structure that is again on one end attached to the Z disc at the end of the sarcomere. Now on the thin filament, there are some other important proteins that play a very significant role in muscle contraction. And these proteins are collectively called regulatory proteins because they help regulate muscle fiber contractions. Again, more on the specifics later. For now, just know where these regulatory proteins are located. So first we have a protein complex made up of three troponin isoforms. So isoforms are like versions of a similar protein. So here in the troponin complex, we have three versions of the troponin protein that work together in its regulatory role. We have troponin C, troponin T, and troponin I. And we will discuss later what each of these troponin isoforms or versions do in the context of muscle fiber contractions. Now you can see that the troponin complex is partly attached to the actin and also this long linear protein right here called tropomyosin, which is another regulatory protein on the thin filament. Again, later we will discuss each of the roles during muscle fiber contractions. Now moving on to the thick filament, which again is attached at the middle of the sarcomere on the M line. The thick film is primarily comprised of myosin or the myosin protein, which is another contractile protein. So if I ask which of the following are myofibrillar contractile proteins, those two proteins would be actin and myosin. So myosin, as you can see right here, has a head and a tail. And these myosin proteins are in very close proximity to the actin. Again, they are overlapping one another. So based on this figure here, we can see that these two myofilaments are in an overlapping position. You can see that in the image of the sarcomere a couple slides back. You can see how again the myofilaments are specially arranged. This is alluding to the fact that these two myofilaments physically interact with one another to create a muscle contraction. Remember, generally we know that when muscle tissue contracts, it shortens or lengthens while producing force. For example, when we flex our elbow, our biceps produce force and it shortens. So in order for the biceps to shorten, the muscle fibers need to shorten. The muscle cells need to shorten. So what is causing the muscle fibers slash cells to shorten during the bicep curl? Well, like I said earlier, we gotta dig deep down to the molecular level. We have to look at what is happening in each individual myofibril, more specifically in each sarcomere and even more specifically between each of the myofilaments. So how do these two myofilaments interact to produce a muscle contraction? So this question can be explained by the fundamental theory that describes how muscles shorten or lengthen during a muscle contraction, like during a bicep curl or a leg extension. 
Now this theory is referred to as the sliding filament theory or the sliding filament model, which is very well supported by scientific evidence for many years. Now the sliding filament theory states that skeletal muscle shortens or lengthens because the thick and thin filaments slide past each other without the individual filaments themselves changing in length. So take a look at this animation here of two sarcomeres in series. So as you can see here, both of these sarcomeres are shortening and lengthening. If all the sarcomeres along the length of each myofibril within a muscle fiber are doing the same thing, the myofibrils will be shortening and lengthening as well. If all the myofibrils are shortening and lengthening, then the muscle fibers will also do the same. If all the muscle fibers are shortening and lengthening, then the muscle tissue will also do the same. So here we see as the sarcomeres are shortening and lengthening, it is not because the thick and thin filaments are shortening and lengthening themselves, rather they are just sliding past one another, hence the sliding filament theory. The Z discs on each end of these sarcomeres gets closer together in a shortening contraction, and then they get further apart during a lengthening contraction. Just imagine curling a dumbbell and then bringing it back down. When you curl the dumbbell inside the fibers that make up your biceps, the myofilaments slide across each other so that the sarcomeres shorten. The Z discs become closer together. When you bring the dumbbell down inside your fibers that make up your biceps, the myofilaments slide across each other back the other way so that the sarcomeres lengthen. The Z discs become further apart. So the next question is, how do the myofilaments actually slide past one another during a contraction? Well, clearly there is some physical interaction, as I alluded to earlier, between the two myofilaments. There is actual physical connection between them and a physical interaction between these two myofilaments to allow them to slide past one another. So how do we get to this point where the myofilaments are sliding past one another? Well, this is where we now discuss the mechanisms underlying muscle contraction, starting all the way from the central nervous system, ending here, where the sarcomeres are shortening and lengthening due to the sliding filament model. So we will explain the step-by-step -step process that leads to this end point here, again, where the myofilaments slide past one another and the muscle fibers and thereby muscle tissue contracts. So skeletal muscle contraction and therefore locomotion, like when we exercise, is explained by a mechanism called excitation contraction coupling. Again, this is explaining the step-by-step -step process that leads us to the sliding filament process, which we saw earlier, which again allows for shortening and lengthening contractions and therefore movement. So let's examine this term excitation contraction coupling or EC coupling for short. So EC coupling is the conjoining of an excitation process to a muscle contraction. Now, when we hear the word excitation, we need to relate that to an increase in the electrical properties of a given cell like a muscle cell. So what this means is that before the muscle can contract, it needs to be excited. It needs to have an increase in its electrical properties. It needs to be zapped to simplify it. So what could zap the muscle and excite it for contraction? Well, it needs an electrical signal. When we think of tissues that create and transmit electrical signals, we often think of the nervous system because nerves and its cells, the neurons, function to carry electrical signals from one place to another. So in the case of a muscle contraction, there is an electrical signal that is carried towards the muscle to quote unquote zap it and to excite it so that it can proceed to contract. So where does this electrical signal come from? As we briefly discussed earlier, it comes from the CNS, the central nervous system, since again, skeletal muscle contractions are voluntary and thus it is a conscious effort. It all starts at the brain, which as we know is the highest order of the central nervous system. So EC coupling is a mechanism whereby an electrical signal generated at the CNS is carried by specialized neurons called motor neurons towards the skeletal muscle fibers those motor neurons are connected to. And that electrical signal subsequently excites the muscle fibers. It again, quote unquote, zaps it. It stimulates the muscle. This excitation of the muscle fibers 
initiates a biochemical process within the muscle leading to the sliding filament process, which again would result in a muscle fiber and therefore muscle tissue contraction. Think of one of those electrical stim machines that PTs and athletic trainers use all the time, or maybe even a taser. We've all seen those before. When it comes into contact with the body, the electrical signals from those machines causes muscles to contract. Why? Because those electrical signals from the machines are similar to the electrical signals that are generated by the CNS and transmitted through the motor neurons. So those electrical signals from the taser or uh, e-stim machine causes artificial EC coupling. So let's discuss EC coupling in much more detail. Let's go over the step-by-step -step process from the CNS to the muscle all the way down to those myofilaments.